Our current sermon series is about holiness. God is holy, and he calls us to be holy also. We started this last Sunday, and we looked at the holiness of God. We looked at how God is holy, and we, we looked at it from the uh, working definition of holiness as being different from. God is different from us. He's different from, from all of the world, all of creation. Uh, he is perfectly uh, knowing, knowledgeable. He knows everything there is to know uh, about the universe. He is perfect in power. He is perfect in presence. He's everywhere at the same time. And he's perfect in his character. He is perfectly good and just and compassionate and kind and faithful. Uh, God is holy and he commands us as his adopted children to be holy also. Now, our holiness is not about being different from him. Our holiness is about being different from non-Christians, from, from everybody else around us, who, from those who are not serving uh, Yahweh through, by faith in Jesus Christ. We are growing from imperfect people to become perfect people. That's what Jesus tells us to do in Matthew's Gospel, chapter uh, 5 and verse 48. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And this is what he's talking about. He's talking about growing from, from our imperfection in, in the, our character to growing to become like Jesus. So let me give you a summary definition of Christian holiness. Christian holiness. Christian holiness is the dedication of one's entire self. That includes body, money, possessions, job, skills, relationships, um, desires. Christian holiness is the dedication of one's entire self to the purposes for which God saves us. Now we're talking about Yahweh, we're talking about the God of the Bible. We are holy to the extent that we give uh, ourselves all that we are and all that we have to God's purposes. Now that takes in a lot of territory. We, we can't cover all of that in one sermon. Uh, we're looking at various aspects of this, but it, it's a lot more than just religious activity. Things that you would label, well, that's a religious thing and prayer and going to church and stuff. It takes in a lot more territory than that. It includes every aspect of our lives. And this series of sermons is hitting on some of those aspects. So I want to start this morning with this question. <clears throat> have you given your complete self to God? Have you given to God your complete self? Have you, have you prayed yourselves into God's hands? Have you made a blank check of your life to God? There are four ways. Some of you don't know what a blank check is. I know you adults do, but, but uh, you youth... Your teens may not know, some of the kids may not know what a blank check is. There's four ways to pay for something. You want to buy something or get something, there's four ways to it. You can give money, you can give cash, uh, bills and coins. Uh, you can use a credit card. Uh, you can trade. Uh, well, I'll give you my car and you give me your truck. Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, you can, there are lots of things you can trade. You can trade possessions. Uh, and I include in here trading gold or trading stocks or trading bitcoins. Um, I include all that stuff in that category. You're trading one thing of that something I have that you want for something that you have that I want. And then a fourth way to pay is with a check. Uh, you may have seen your parents use a check. I made a blow up of a check here. Uh, uh, this is a sample check. It doesn't have all the numbers down here that you're supposed to have. This one just has a bunch of zeros. Uh, but a sample check to show you what it's, what it's about. And so on the check, you write, first of all, you write in the date up here. And then there's little words here. It says, pay to the order of. Pay to the order of. And then there's a long blank line. And so if I was going to write you a check, I would write your name in that long line. Pay to the order of so-and-so. John Smith. Joe Doe. Um, and then it has over here a dollar sign and a big box uh, or small box and then another long line. And so you write in here in numerals the amount of money that you're going to give to the other person. And then you write out that in words down here. 
So you, do, you put the amount in twice, in numbers and then in words, so, so to help avoid mistakes that way. And then I would sign it down on this line, and I would give it to you. And you would take it to my bank, and uh, my bank would say, oh, Robin Shiflett wants to give um, this amount of money to this person. And they would, they would take the check uh, and give you the money for it. Uh, or they might take it to, you might take it to your bank and your bank would contact my bank and my bank would say, oh, Robin Shiflett's going to give that much money. So that's what a check is. Now, sometimes under certain circumstances, you might give someone a check made out with their name on it and not put anything in the amount. Maybe the amount isn't known yet. Maybe there's some cir circumstances that have to come about before we know how much needs to be in there. And I trust you, I'm gonna give it to you as a blank check and I'll let you fill in the amount later. I'll let you fill in the amount later. So that's the concept of a check and that's the concept of a blank check where you put the person's name in, but you don't write in uh, how much you're going to give them. Well, the idea of giving your life as a blank check to God is, uh, is that you write, uh, you write God on here, uh, figuratively speaking, and you don't write anything in the amount. You just say, God, you can have my life. You can have my life in all that I am and all that I have. I give it to you for however you want to use it. That's giving your life as a blank check to God. And you don't know what he's going to fill in for the amount. You don't know what he's going to require of you. You don't know what he might ask you to do a year from now or two years from now or 10 years from now. Um, when you finish school, you don't know what he's going to ask you to do. I was in high school when he called me to be a pastor. Some people were in college or they finished college. I know I knew people in seminary, they had been in a career for 20 years when God said, I want you to be, a, I want you to become a pastor or a missionary or some other thing. Uh, and I'm not just talking about God calling you into full-time Christian vocational ministry. There are things that God calls, may call any of us to do right in our neighborhood uh, in terms of, of being a witness for him. So the idea of giving your life as a blank check to God, that, that's a picture of holiness. It's a picture of Christian holiness, is that you give your life to God uh, as a blank check. Now, one aspect of who we are, what we are, uh, when I talk about giving your whole self, one aspect of, of each of us is the money and possessions that we have. And so holiness then includes giving these to God, uh, to give all of your money and all of your possessions to God. Now, I don't mean giving it to the church. You could take an offering plate and you could, you could, you know, you could write a check for all of my money, whatever you have in the bank, and all of my money and give it to the God, give it to God. I don't necessarily mean giving it to the church either. Uh, you couldn't put your bicycle in there. You could put a cell phone in there, but you couldn't put a boom box in there. Uh, you couldn't put a car in there. You couldn't put, there's lots of things you couldn't fit in an offering plate uh, and take it to the church. But I'm not talking about giving it to the church when I talk about giving it to God. I simply mean that you pray to God and say, God, I belong to you and all I have is yours and I'm going to use what I have to honor you, to serve your purposes in a way that you would be pleased with. This recognizes the holiness view of money. This recognizes the holiness view of money. Let me give you a definition here. The holiness view of money and possessions is this. God owns it all. God owns it all. It, it all belongs to him. Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's. The earth belongs to the Lord and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, they all belong to God. He, he made us and he made us for his purposes. Uh, I, I tell you that regularly because that's one of those key statements you need to get in your mind and keep there uh, in, in your heart. Uh, just like we're all sinners in need of a Savior, God created us for His purposes. We, 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 
the, the kind of a basis of what upon which we live, one of those foundational truths. And it's even more so true of Christians. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Paul writes, you are not your own. He's talking, to, he's writing to Christians. You are not your own. In other words, you don't belong to you. You belong to somebody else. You were bought at a price. You were bought at a price. You don't belong to you. You belong to Jesus. Jesus purchased us for God with his blood. And that includes everything we are and everything we own. The state of Maryland thinks that I own a house and a pickup truck and, a, and an SUV. Actually, Jesus owns those things. They belong to him. He purchased me and all that I have with his blood. So my money is his money. And my life purpose, figuring out why I'm here in this world, my life purpose is discovered in relationship to him. And so is yours. But this is not what most people believe and live out. This is not what non-Christians believe and live out. Instead of looking to Jesus for meaning, they look to other things. And many of them look to money for meaning in life. Money represents various kinds of meaning to different people. To some people, money represents security. It represents security. Uh, if they have a lot of money in the bank or they have a high paying job, um, uh, they feel secure. They feel safe. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, let the recession come. I'm going to be okay. I got all this money. Well, uh, I, got, I got stocks. I got money in the bank. I got a good job. But as the recession shows, stocks crash, uh, banks go bankrupt, uh, and jobs can be lost. You can be laid off from a job. Uh, but to some people, money represents security. To some people, money represents pleasure. Uh, having more money than they need or pursuing money it provides for the hedonistic pleasures that they live for. To some people, money represents status uh, or popularity. Maybe you've heard the phrase, keeping up with the Joneses, uh, which is a form of peer pressure. It means that, that if you're all, all your friends or all your neighbors have one of these, that you, you try to get one too because you're trying to fit in. You're trying to be one of the gang. Uh, it's the form of peer pressure that we place upon ourselves. Um, one person wrote, one reason why it's hard to save money is that our neighbors are always buying something that we can't afford. And someone else said, people are funny. They spend money they don't have to buy things they don't need to impress folks they don't like. <laughs> There's a lot of truth in those statements. To some people, uh, some people, uh, money represents status. To some people, money represents popularity. They use money to impress people. They're, they always have to have the newest thing and the best thing just, just to impress other people. Uh, and to some people, money represents freedom. It represents freedom. Uh, we've all been uh, locked down since uh, mid-March, uh, here in Maryland anyway. We've been in lockdown um, you can travel if you want to, but a lot of people feel it's not safe to travel uh, right now. And, 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 and some people figure it out over the course of these months, the only safe way to travel would be to take our room with us. And so uh, recreational vehicle sales have been up. RV sales have been uh, way up this year uh, as people are buying them so they, they can travel, um, take their bed and their kitchen with them, so to speak. Now, you may see in one of these pictures, you may see somebody you know. Oh, yeah, I know somebody that, that treats money that way. Uh, or maybe you've seen yourself in all of this, uh, that, that one of these is true of you in your life. Um, now, all of these are human-centered views of money, whereas Christian holiness adopts a God-centered view of money. Money is an idol if you worship it, is if you if you look to that for the meaning uh, of your life. So Christian holiness looks toward money as uh, something to serve the Lord with. 
and bring glory to him. So here's an application for us this morning. We must use money for our needs while guarding against its dangers. We must use money for our needs while guarding against its dangers. We must live with an awareness that money is both a good thing, there are advantages to money, but there are disadvantages to, to having more money than we need or pursuing money for itself. Uh, benefits and dangers of money. The advantage is that we have enough uh, to provide for our needs, food, uh, clothing, transportation to a job, that would certainly be included in a need. Uh, a roof over our head where you can stay war at least stay warm in the winter, if not cool in the summer. Uh, and, and to some degree, health care as well is a need. All of these things we need in order to function in the world. And there are other things in our modern world that we need uh, to function. Uh, as an adult these days, you almost have to have an email address. Somebody in the family almost has to have an email address. My doctor expects me to have an email address. My dentist expects me to have an email address. Um, fortunately, my mechanic doesn't, but all kinds of things online. You want to purchase something online, they expect you to have an email address. Uh, and one of the other things that you almost have to have in today's world is a cell phone. Uh, if nothing else, then for emergencies when you're out, um, some of you don't know, you younger folks, you don't know what a payphone is. A payphone was a phone at a gas station or in a store that you went up and you put a coin in, you put a quarter or a dime in, it was a dime when I was a kid, and you could make a phone call. There was a phone there that you put money in and you could make a call to somebody, a local call, <laughs> not a long distance call. And, uh, and I always, as a, as a high school student, as a college student, as a young adult, I always had money in my pocket. I always had coins in my pocket in case I had to make a phone call because there were no cell phones. They didn't exist. The only phones were the house phone, the landline, and a pay phone out someplace in the community. Um, and now today, there are no pay phones. They, 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 they've gotten rid of them because everybody has a cell phone. Almost everybody has a cell phone. Um, so you almost have to have a cell phone for emergencies and such these days. Well, having enough money for your needs is a reason to rejoice. Uh, having enough money for your needs is a reason to rejoice. And, and we all need a certain amount of money in order to meet our basic needs. And we should give thanks for, to God for meeting our needs on a regular basis. We should give thanks and choose to be content with that much, uh, with just that much. Uh, looking at 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, my check is in the way here. Paul writes about money to Timothy and the church that he was serving. And he says, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, godliness, godliness is connected to holiness. It's is looking to God for what he wants us to do, how he wants us to live, uh, seeking to know what God's will is and living it out. That's godliness. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. We'll be content with that. Now, again, in our world and our geographical area, you need a little bit more than just food and clothing. But we can choose to have an attitude of contentment. We can choose to be content with what we already own right now. Right now. Uh, throw, your, throw your wish list out the window and choose to be content with what you have right now uh, if your basic needs are being met. But there are dangers associated with money, with having more than you need for your basic needs, or an attitude of pursuing for whatever reason, uh, pursuing more. And he says that in the, mentions that in the following verses, we pick up in verse nine. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith, the Christian faith, and pierced themselves with many griefs. 
Notice the language here associated with the pursuit of money. Temptation, traps, harmful desires, ruin, destruction. Uh, maybe bankruptcy is in there. Sin and griefs. He's emphasizing the dangers of the pursuit of money or uh, of having more money than you need. He goes into that further in that passage. There's the, let me, let me mention a couple of dangers to you of, of pursuit of money. There's the danger of addiction to impulse buying. There's the danger of addiction to impulse buying. Um, this impulse buying may involve one of those earlier attitudes towards money uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, but it makes us a slave to, to whatever ha we happen to notice at the moment. Uh, whatever we have it is at the moment. When I would watch TV with my sons when they were small, of course they watch cartoons and the commercials for cartoons are usually about toys or uh, uh, very sweetened breakfast cereals, those kinds of things. And they say, oh, dad, can we get one of those? You know, they, they didn't want it five minutes ago, but they suddenly see it on TV. Oh, I want, yeah, I want one of those. Um, impulse. But an hour from now, they wouldn't even be thinking of it an hour from now. They wouldn't, they wouldn't know about it. And if you asked them, well, what do you want for your birthday? They wouldn't put that on the list. It wasn't something they really needed. It wasn't something they really wanted. It was just an impulse buy. And often people who are guilty of impulse buying, they end up buying things they don't need or can't afford. Years ago, a long, long time ago now, one of the men who worked for my father, um, was had an addiction to impulse buying, and he'd get his paycheck and he'd he'd spend it on all kinds of things, and then when the rent was due, he wouldn't have his rent money. He was always in trouble with his landlords. He'd get out kicked out of this place and have to go to a new place, and and uh, and, and I don't know how it came about, but in talking about these th this thing with my father, I don't know who suggested it. Maybe my dad. But anyway, they got to the point, this man, when he got paid, would give his money to my father to hold. And he'd take a little bit of money, but, you know, not all of it. And then when his rent was due, he'd come back to my dad and get the rest of his money so he could pay his rent. Since he didn't have that rent money in his pocket, he, wasn't, he, he couldn't spend it on whatever impulsive things came up. He was enslaved to impulse buying, and he had never developed the self-control over that addiction. Does that describe your relationship with money? Uh, or maybe someone you know has that tendency? Um, slave to whatever advertisements show up on TV this week. Another danger with the pursuit of money is the danger of neglecting family in the pursuit of money. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, someone on their deathbed has said, you know, I wish I went to work more. All those years, I wish I went to work more. Um, I've never heard of anybody saying that, but, maybe there has, but I have heard of people saying, I wish I'd spent more time with my family. Instead of working so much, I wish I'd spent more time with my family, with my kids, with my wife, because kids grow up fast and couples can tend to drift apart from each other. So one danger of pursuing money is the neglect of family. And then a third one, uh, and maybe you've heard of this, maybe you haven't. This is the danger of spending more to match the best you have. Let me explain. This is a real thing. Uh, it has a name, the Diderot effect, the Diderot effect. Um, back in the 1700s, there was a famous French philosopher named Denis Diderot, uh, who his whole life had lived in poverty. He never had much, um, but uh, he, he had a wife, he had uh, kids, uh, he had uh, some income, he had uh, a job. He was famous because he had authored an encyclopedia at the time. Uh, well, in 1765, at 52 years of age, his daughter was getting married. Not his daughter was 52. He was 52. But his daughter was getting married. And it was common in those days for the uh, 
the, the wife to bring a, what's called a dowry, uh, which was, uh, it might have been money, but more often it was uh, household furnishings that uh, she had saved over the years for when she got married. And so it might be a set of dishes, it might be some furniture, that kind of thing. He didn't have anything to provide his daughter because he was, he was broke. He didn't have any money, he was poor. And um, word got out about this because he was a famous person and Catherine the Great, the Empress of Russia, offered him a thousand pounds for his library. Uh, well, that's about $50,000 in, in today's US money. So suddenly he had lots of money. He had more of the money than he needed. He gave his daughter you know, a good dowry and, and uh, one of the first things he got for himself was a robe, uh, kind of like a bathrobe, some, a robe that you would wear around the house. You, you can imagine uh, in, in, in Europe that in the wintertime, uh, houses weren't heated like they are the, today. Uh, you might have a fireplace, but it wasn't central heat. We've got heat pouring out of every room, you know. And, uh, and so people dressed warmer, and often they would wear a robe around the house. Well, he had an old, you know, ratty robe, and suddenly he got a brand new one. It was scarlet in color, and, and I don't know if it was silk or what it was made of, but it was really nice and really fancy and really beautiful. And that's when everything went wrong. Because he's wearing this wonderful, beautiful robe, and he's walking around his house, and he realizes that compared to the robe, everything in his house, every other thing that he owned looked shabby and worn and dirty and, you know. And so he, I, I, he's he got money now. He starts buying stuff to replace. He replaced all of his possessions. He got rid of the straw chair with a leather chair and the old kitchen table, the new kitchen table, statues and a big mirror over the mantel place and, and, and all kinds of things. Uh, a rug from Damascus. He ended up in debt. He ended up in debt. And at the end, he said this, I was the master of my old robe, but I'm the slave of my new one. Well, these reactive purchases have become known as the Diderot effect. Attaining a new possession often creates a spiral of consumption, which leads you to acquire more new things. And as a result, you end up buying things that your previous self never needed in order to feel happy or fulfilled. Maybe you've done that, experienced that. You got new curtains, and then, well, you know, next to that, next to that old wall, that, that those curtains look, you know, time to paint that wall. Time to get a new couch. You get a new dress. Well, now I need shoes and a, and a bag to match, uh, or whatever it might be. Um, you buy something new, and then you realize that everything else in comparison just doesn't match up, and you start replacing other stuff. One, one purchase leads to another purchase, leads to another purchase, leads to another purchase. So there are dangers. It's just a few of the dangers associated with the pursuit of money or having more money than we need. And we, as people pursuing holiness need to guard against such dangers. If we would pursue holiness, we must dedicate our money and our possessions to God. And to the extent then that we do so, we will be holy. Have you given to God your complete self? Have you prayed yourself into the hands of God? You belong to him. Jesus purchased you with his blood.